Next on Unsolved Mysteries. Folsom Prism was virtually escape proof until convicted killer Steve Wilson broke out. How did he pull it off? Two women are brutally attacked. One dies, the other, the only witness to the crime, is left with amnesia. At first, it looked like a tragic accident. But this woman's death was actually a clever, professional hit, and her killer is still on the loose. And neighbors notice that the family next door hasn't been around lately. And there's a good reason. They've all been murdered. Cunning, deceit, and lies. Can you figure out who's telling the truth? I'm Dennis Farina, and this is Unsolved Mysteries. Join us. Lancia, California. He had rugged good looks and smooth talking charm. When 30-year-old Steve Wilson showed up in this small ranching town, he quickly made friends with the locals. People liked Steve Wilson. He could tell you anything you wanted to hear and make you believe it. He was very much involved with the college. He liked to lift weights. He liked to weld. And when he was around a group of people that he enjoyed, he was very friendly and very uh, fun to be around. Wilson said that he was from San Diego, but he never revealed any details about his past. He was a jack of all trades, who occasionally did odd jobs on a ranch owned by Bill Thornburg. While working there, Wilson met 22-year-old Callie Thornburg, who lived at home and worked with her father. Steve Wilson was instantly attracted to her, and nine months later, Steve and Callie ran off to Reno and were married. Dad uh, wanted me to get married because he felt that I needed to have something other than him and the ranch. As we were driving to Reno, or even the day before we left, I was wishing there was some way that I could get out of it. The marriage was a disaster. Wilson was abusive and he threatened Callie. Just two months after their wedding, Callie left him and moved back in with her father. Well, I don't like to say this. Wilson Callie. was no longer welcome at their really ranch. Your life, the guy's a nut. Wilson would call on the phone and harass us. And he would say things like, I will hurt you worse than you've ever been hurt before. Uh, I will take everything you love away from you. You will pay. You will learn to love me. You will learn that loving me is easier than being away from me. About three weeks after the breakup, Wilson showed up to get Callie back. Callie! What do you want, Wilson? Get between me and Callie! Get off the ranch! Why are you doing this to me? Just go away! I love you, Callie. I'm asking, I'm telling you, Wilson, get off this ranch. You hear what I'm saying? No, it's not worth I grabbed my dad and grabbed the gun and said, no, don't shoot him. It's not worth it. You know, I didn't want my father and Wilson to get into any kind of a confrontation with each other because I was afraid that Wilson would hurt my dad. A few days later, Bill Thornburg left the ranch house to do his morning chores. Dad! I walked out to the water lines and I found his truck with his every morning cup of coffee sitting on the dashboard and it was still hot. Dad! Bill Thornburg was never seen again and Steve Wilson disappeared. Seven months passed, and then, 
On Christmas Eve, a teenager riding his bike through the desert, 45 miles south of the ranch house, made a gruesome discovery. The boy knew his parents wouldn't believe him if he told them, so he, he actually took the head and rode back to his house. Uh, with the evidence at the scene, the clothing, and different articles, it was immediately uh, known that it was Bill Thornburg's body. And the, all the evidence led to Steve Wilson. After a year and a half on the run, Steve Wilson was finally arrested in Las Vegas. He pleaded guilty to first-degree murder and received a sentence of 25 years to life at Folsom Prison in California. There hadn't been an escape from Folsom Prison in 15 years. Folsom Prison is a maximum security facility filled with violent killers. When Steve Wilson arrived, he immediately started trying to get on the good side of the officers and the administrators. He joined the in-house work program and successfully charmed anyone who could help him. Steve was a model prisoner. I have 30 years in his career of mine, and I would have to say that this guy is the greatest clerk I've ever had. Before long, Wilson became the clerk in charge of shipping. It was one of the best jobs in the prison because it offered the most freedom to move around. Hey, Larry. Hey, Steve. How you doing? When he became a clerk in, in the warehouse up uh, adjacent to the metal factory and the license plate factory, his job would entail him being in all different areas of the, uh, of the warehouse, picking up uh, inventories, picking up invoices, work orders. So for him to be in a certain area at any time would not be unusual, would not be significant. And if he wasn't there, would not be significant either. Two years passed. Prison officials had no idea that during that entire time, Wilson was plotting his escape. One day, while he was working near the loading dock... Hey! What? What's your problem? He ran into me. Listen, I told you about this safety last week. It was his fault. Watch it! Wilson had enlisted other inmates to distract the guards. His plan had worked. Nobody noticed that he was gone. I think he was planning this at least well over a year ahead of time. He was an intelligent individual, and uh, when you have vehicles going in and out of a secure area, that's your weakest link. As soon as the truck left the prison, Wilson cut a hole in the roof using tin snips that he had stolen from the prison metal shop. Just minutes later, the truck pulled into a local bowling alley. When the driver went inside for a cup of coffee, Wilson squeezed through the hole he had cut and disappeared. Having Wilson on the loose is very hard for me because I can never really relax. I don't like being alone. And I'm always looking around all the corners. I. I'm constantly in fear. Update. Steve Wilson was arrested in England after a tip helped FBI agents trace him to a London hotel. Wilson was brought back to California to complete his prison term of 25 years to life. But he was soon up to his old tricks. Wilson arranged to have escape materials sent to him in prison. After officials intercepted the package, they sent Wilson to a state-of-the-art maximum security prison for violent criminals. He served his time and has been released. Coming up was a young businesswoman murdered to prevent her from blowing the whistle on illegal banking activities. Washington, D.C. In the early morning, fire units raced to a blaze in the Georgetown district. Once inside, firefighters discover that the blaze is restricted to the upstairs bedroom. In fact, the bed itself is on fire. At first, it looks like no one is home. 
But as the smoke begins to clear, the firefighters are stunned to see a woman in the bed. She is barely alive. 38-year-old Lynn Amos is a financial analyst who has lived in Washington for just five months. She is rushed to a local hospital with third degree burns over 80% of her body. At first, investigators believed that it was an accident. Lynn's blood alcohol content was 0.25, two and a half times the legal limit for driving in Washington, D.C. That and the fact that they had found a cigarette butt seemed to indicate that Lynn Amos had been smoking in bed. But Lynn's family and friends didn't believe that. Well, Lynn didn't smoke. I smoked until recently. If you're a closet smoker, you certainly smoke with your friends who smoke. There were no dirty ashtrays in the house. There were no matches. There were no cigarette packs. There was no evidence that she was smoking in bed. The police had to rethink their initial theory when insurance investigators found accelerants on the mattress, floor, and pillow. They concluded that the fire had been deliberately set. The insurance investigators report showed that there was a combination of kerosene, gasoline, and turpentine. And the doctor has told me that her burns were consistent with those from a fire that was accelerated. He told me at the hospital, he couldn't believe that only she and the bed burned. Uh, he said she looked like the result of a house having been burned around her. Lynn Amos clung to life, barely conscious and unable to speak. Then 10 days later, she died. The cause of death was officially listed as homicide. Who would want Lynn Amos dead and why? She was a friendly and outgoing person with no known enemies, but Lynn apparently did have her secrets. In the weeks before she died, she had suddenly stopped talking to her friends about her job. A motive for Lynn's murder soon began to emerge. Lynn Amos had moved to Washington to take a position with a management consulting firm. As part of her job, she made frequent trips to Mexico to assess the lending practices of several large banks. Less than a month before the fire, Lynn had lunch with a close friend, Emily Smith. Lynn seemed reluctant to talk about her work. I realized when we were having lunch that I didn't know what she was working on, and that was unusual because we talked about work a lot. We did sort of similar types things. So tell me about work. Well, I've been working on this project for the Mexican equivalent of the Federal Reserve. And I've seen some very bad lending practices. I waited, and it was clear she wasn't going to say more. So I said, well, is your report going to be ugly? And she said, yes, it's going to be really ugly. The day before the fire, Lynn once again hinted to friends that she had uncovered some potentially explosive information. Are you still on that project with the banks? Yeah. Um, I've seen some uh, dangerous things in Mexico. I I'm purely speculating here. Um, but it's possible that she bumped into a loan having to do with drug money or a fraudulent loan. That's the sort of thing you might bump into when you're reviewing credit portfolios. No. No, the last time anyone spoke to Lynn was late on the night of the fire. We do know that she called her office to confirm that she was going to be late for work the next day. So we know Lynn was at home, lucid, completely fine, had a 30-minute conversation at 10 o'clock at night. At 10.30, she then, we then don't know what happened. When we first told our attorney how Lynn was killed, his first statement was, that's a professional hit. The uh, fire detective who came to the scene said that it had all the indications that this was a controlled fire that somebody was there making sure that this fire didn't do more than it needed to do. Lynn's family and friends believe that sometime after midnight, the killer broke into the townhouse. There were no signs of forced entry, so he may have had a key. Or maybe Lynn knew 
her assailant. You do what I tell you. I don't want to have to use this. <laughs> the intruder may have then forced Lynn to drink until she passed out. To achieve the level of alcohol that she was found with, it takes between 9 and 14 drinks in an hour for a woman her size, which is almost impossible to consume. That means you have a new drink every four to seven minutes. And then the killer tried to make her death look like an accident. What was done to Lynn Amos was so horrible. I really do not have the words to describe it. Lynn was just a great friend. She was really fun. She loved life. And uh, people should not be allowed to, to get away with that. Lynn Amos never completed her report on the Mexican banks. Her former employer declined to appear on camera for this segment. In a letter to our producers, he wrote, we are troubled by the same questions being asked by investigators. We can only hope that forensic science will provide some answers. If you have any information about the death of Lynn Amos, please log on to unsolved.com. Next, a woman survives a brutal murder attempt. However, she now has amnesia and cannot identify her attacker. Socket, Rhode Island. At approximately 3.30 p.m., Doug Heath returned home from work to his apartment on Providence Street. As he walked through the door, he found his neighbor's three-year-old child locked out of her apartment. Hi, Nicole. When I saw Nicole standing on the stairs, I knew immediately something was wrong. Where's mommy? I asked her where her mother was, and she told me that she was downstairs lying down. I tried the door into the first floor apartment, their apartment, and it was locked. And I knew something was, was wrong right there. Doug went down to the laundry room to check on her mother, Susan Laferte. I saw her body leaned up against the dryer. In the same instant, I turned to my left and I saw Sue lying face down in a puddle of blood. When rescue arrived at the scene along with the first officers, they found that two women had been brutally assaulted in a basement area of the Providence Street home, and for all intents and purposes, had been left for dead. One woman expired at the scene, and the other one was in very, very critical condition. Rescue stabilized her the best that they could and transported her from the scene to the hospital emergency room. 22-year-old Doreen Picard was pronounced dead at the scene. The other woman, 27-year-old Susan Laferte, was barely alive. Naturally, I was shocked when I saw the condition that my wife was in because she had no physical resemblance at all of being my wife from the severe injuries, all the swelling, and the way they described it, she was hanging by a thread. Her injuries were so uh, severe that it was touch and go at the time. Susan survived, but she remained in a deep coma. Fearing for her safety, the police guarded her room around the clock. It was obvious to us that the perpetrator, in his mind, had left both girls for dead. We immediately became worried that he would realize that there was a witness to the attack and that he would come back and try to eliminate that witness by killing her. 30 days later, Susan finally came out of her coma, but she had no memory of the attack or her assailant. Investigators had no motive and no eyewitness. They had to start from scratch. I don't know who attacked us. It's five years later, and I'm no closer at this period of time 
than I was five years ago. I don't know what he looked like um, or anything else about him. I have no memory whatsoever of the attack. What she does remember is this. On February 19th, the day of the attack, Susan's sister, Carol Rivett, came over for lunch. At 1.30, two of Susan's friends came to the door. Hi. Hi. My sister came back from the doorway and stuck her head in the parlor and said, Carol, I'm going downstairs. I'll be right back. She came back upstairs and I could hear her talking to somebody in the doorway. So I got up to go see who she was talking to. The two men were interested in some pit bull puppies that Susan was selling. Susan talked to the men for five minutes and then they left. Ten minutes later, at 1.45, Carol went home. And that was the last time anyone saw Susan before the attack. No one can be sure what happened that day between 1.45 and 3.20 when Doug Heath discovered Susan and Doreen's bodies. I have to admit that I was shocked by the initial scene. The brutality of the assault. It was not just a murder. It was not just an assault. It was a, a frenzied attack. It was an overkill. Okay, 15 moments, okay. Other than Susan, there was only one other witness to the crime, Nicole, Susan's three-year-old daughter. As I came in the house, Nicole was there. And from the very beginning, she told me that she let him in. She thought that was her mother's friend. She saw the man. She says he was okay. probably a little bigger than her father. He had a mustache. She even told me that he w wore a cap with a visor towards the back. He had sneakers, and he also had uh, jeans. When she heard her mother crying, she went downstairs and as she was going down, he was coming up. He had a, a, a rag in his back pocket. It was red and white. She called it polka dot. And then she was locked out in the hallway while the man escaped through the front. After the assault, Nicole was questioned extensively by the police department. As much as the police would like to have a person who definitely saw the perpetrator that day, her story has changed too much to be of real value to us. The stress and confusion that she was under at that point in time really made it very difficult to get a real solid, sure story. Four days after the attack, the murder weapon, a metal pipe, was found in the house. It had been wiped clean of fingerprints. There was little to go on, and the police investigation stalled. Update. A man named Raymond Tempest has been convicted of killing Doreen Picard. Apparently, Tempest attacked Susan with a pipe after arguing over a litter of pit bull puppies and killed Picard when she walked in on the assault. The investigation was hindered by a possible police cover-up. Raymond Tempest's brother, Gordon, was a police officer at the time of the murders. Gordon Tempest was sentenced to seven years for perjury. He has served his time and was released. Raymond Tempest received the sentence of 85 years for murdering Doreen Picard. Next, a government official is suspected of murdering his entire family. And he's been missing for over three decades. Columbia, North Carolina. A state park ranger responds to a report of a brush fire in a remote wooded area. As the ranger brings the fire under control, he finds an empty gas can and a shovel. When the smoke clears, the ranger also discovers the remains of five partially charred bodies in a shallow grave three young boys and two women. Investigators had only a few clues. The victim's clothes had labels from expensive department stores in Bethesda, Maryland. 
The shovel came from a hardware store in the same area. However, Bethesda police had no missing persons reports that they could link to the bodies until six days later. I received a radio call to investigate the absence of five persons from a residence in Bethesda. The unit 12 direct. The call came from a neighbor of William Bradford Bishop, a respected economist with the State Department. There was a common driveway to the neighbor's home and to the Bishop home. And I met the neighbor there to investigate the whereabouts of the family. You called in a missing person report? Yeah, the bishops it usually when they go out. It was rather routine to do an investigation like this. It's not unusual. OK, thank you. And I wasn't overly concerned about it until I reached the front step of the um, home and I noticed there were blood droplets on the front step. Upon opening the front door, I saw blood droplets uh, leading from the doorway through the foyer and to a set of stairs that led to the upper bedroom level of the home. And going to the stairs, I observed blood splatterings on the wall and in the one bedroom that I could see into, almost the entire ceiling and wall was completely splattered with blood. Hardly a place you could put your hand, there wasn't blood splatterings. I had been a police officer for approximately 12 years, and this was the worst scene that I've ever observed. Authorities were finally able to identify the five bodies. Brad Bishop's wife, Annette, his three sons, and his mother. There was no sign of Brad Bishop. Was he also a victim, or was there a far more sinister explanation for his disappearance? Bishop worked for the State Department as a director of commercial practices and trade. To most of his co-workers, he seemed to be on the fast track to a high-level job. But at least one co-worker saw a different side of Brad Bishop. Brad Bishop had extensive experience overseas. He liked the international scene from the time he was in the Army in Italy. Brad's career uh, was very much on track, although he was exceedingly despondent about not uh, getting a promotion. Roy Harrell ran into Bishop just outside the State Department on the day the annual promotion list came out. What's the matter? I didn't make the promotion list again. Well, neither did I. He said, I think I'm getting the flu. I don't feel well at all. And uh, that's the reason I'm leaving work now. OK. Let's get a taxi. So I helped him hail a taxi, and I watched him drive out. The next day, Brad Bishop's family was found dead, and he had disappeared. Almost three weeks after the murders, a ranger in Tennessee discovered an abandoned station wagon. In the back, he found what looked like dried blood. The car was registered to William Bradford Bishop. Bishop was now the prime suspect in the slaying of his own family. There was enough evidence for a warrant to be issued for his arrest for homicide based on the fact that there appeared to be premeditation in connection with the events that occurred on March 1st. The FBI has pieced together Bishop's activities leading up to the murders. On the day he left the State Department, he withdrew several hundred dollars from his bank account and went to a local hardware store and gas station. As far as we know, after that, he returned to his home, probably around 7.30 to 8 o'clock at night after the children were put to bed. Our investigation shows that Mrs. Bishop was probably killed first. She was found beside a book which she may have been reading at the time that, that she was killed. 
The children were probably killed next, followed by Bishop's mother. They were all killed with a blunt instrument and none of the victims had an opportunity to defend themselves. According to the FBI, Bishop loaded the five bodies into the family station wagon and headed 200 miles south to the countryside near Columbia, North Carolina. Brad Bishop felt from the time I knew him that there was something lacking in himself. This feeling was nourished constantly by both his mother and to some degree his wife, who constantly told him he was inadequate and washed up and uh, wasn't going anywhere in his career. And I think that uh, he conceived in his mind this was a way to, as he often said uh, many times about other people, this would be a way of putting them in their place. After buying a pair of tennis shoes near the site of the fire, Bishop drove 400 miles to the Great Smoky Mountains in Tennessee, where his station wagon was found abandoned. Brad Bishop successfully covered his tracks and was not seen for two years. Then, 5,000 miles away in Sorrento, Italy, a bizarre coincidence. Roy Harrell came face to face with Bishop in a bus station restroom. I was washing my hands and uh, this bearded, disheveled looking man came in. In my mind's eye, I took the beard and the scrubby clothes off of him and I saw the Brad Bishop I had seen coming out of the State Department. Oh my God. No! I followed him and watched him disappear down the cliffs going toward the boat landing where boats go to Capri. Bishop is wanted by the FBI, Interpol, and the U.S. Marshals. He has evaded capture for over 30 years. Authorities believe he is living in Europe. William Bradford Bishop is six feet one inches tall with brown hair, brown eyes, and a medium build. He is fluent in French, Italian, and Serbo-Croatian, and holds a diplomatic passport. The FBI created this computer-aged photograph to reflect how Bishop might look today. If you have any information about this case, please contact us at unsolved.com. Next, a woman is reunited with a little girl she took into her home 40 years ago. Bob! It was the fall of 1969. Glendine Butterfield rushed to greet her niece, Kellyanne, who she planned to raise as part of her own family. Glendine's brother, Bob Ayers, was in the army and being shipped to Germany. He and Kellyanne's mother were separated and neither was able to care for the child. Glendine was granted legal custody. Kellyanne spent the next few years happily growing up with Glendine and her children. She liked her horse, she liked riding horses. She just did everything. Anybody's normal kid did I mean, no different than them, except they were a little older. You know, I mean, she just <laughs> happy, go lucky. She was no different than my sister, Vicky, except for more fun. <laughs> she doesn't even know what it's like to have a father. Kellyanne was four years old when Bob suddenly returned and wanted his daughter back. Glendine was worried that her brother couldn't provide adequate care for Kellyanne so she began looking for a more suitable home. You don't stand a chance. Kellyanne's birth mother, Marion, was in the Air Force. She was married and had two sons. Glendine felt that she could provide the stable environment that Kellyanne needed. A judge agreed to the plan. I'm gonna miss you so much. I love you. I don't know where you need to go. 
What Glendine didn't know was that the tearful parting would be the last time she would see Kellyanne. There hasn't been one day went by since I gave her up that I haven't thought of her a dozen times and wondered, is she okay? Does she need anything? Is she happy? I just wish I knew. Update. Within minutes of our broadcast, we heard from a friend of Kelly Ann's family. She told us that Kelly Ann was married, the mother of two young children, and now living in Anchorage, Alaska. Kelly Ann and Glendine spoke on the phone that night and made plans to get together. It feels wonderful. I just can't believe I found her. I don't believe it. <laughs> All these years, I've pitched her like she's still six and a half years old. I never could imagine her growing up. <laughs> Hearing from her again, has, it has filled gaps in my life that I have felt like, you know, there's part of my life missing. You know, where is it, you know? And I always feel like I'm looking for something. But, you know, to know that she's cared about me and loved me all these years is a very good feeling. Truck. Glendine and Kellyanne spent time catching up on the missing years. After the reunion, they continued to stay in touch. The Mona Lisa, Leonardo da Vinci's masterpiece. Through the centuries, millions have been drawn to its mystery and beauty. Most art historians say that Mona Lisa was the wife of a prosperous merchant. But could the portrait hide a secret identity? When Leonardo da Vinci died in 1519, the secret of Mona Lisa's identity went with him to the grave. However, a recent computer analysis of the portrait has uncovered a new intriguing theory. Lillian Schwartz, co-author of the Computer Artist's Handbook, pioneered the use of the computer in art. Lillian and a colleague were working with a new computer program when she compared a self-portrait of Leonardo da Vinci to the Mona Lisa. When the self-portrait was reversed and placed beside the Mona Lisa, a single face emerged. The results were amazing. This was an incredible match. When I pointed this out, I said, my God, I can look at this, look at this. I mean, Leonardo probably used himself for the model for the Mona Lisa. The two faces appeared to be a perfect match. The eyes, the nose, and especially the mouth. Using a different computer, Lillian and her colleague even managed to turn up the corners of the self-portrait's mouth to copy the famous Mona Lisa smile. Next, they compared the foreheads. An extremely important clue was that the superorbital ridge that is very prominent in the Mona Lisa image and in Leonardo's self-portrait is found in almost all males, over 90% males. Rarely would you see that in a female head. Did Leonardo da Vinci actually serve as the model for one of the world's most beautiful women? Lillian Schwartz took her findings to magazine publisher Wick Allison. Initially, I was very skeptical of Lillian's discovery. But when I got to understand um, the very detailed work being done in the laboratory, um, it started to make uh, not only sense to me that this was the answer, but uh, as we got to know more about human facial characteristics, uh, that it was the only answer. There's certain things that right away would puzzle an art historian. One is that the images, Leonardo's images, say the Mona Lisa, is remarkable precisely for the fact that it's not very distinct. The outlines of the face are not very strongly marked. There's a shadow under the nose, so you can't tell exactly how long it is. So if one wants to apply an, a scale, there's nothing that tells you exactly where that scale should go. In other words, 
you're placing something very specific on top of something that's not very specific. Professor Kathleen Brandt is also skeptical about whether the drawing is a self-portrait. If it was done by da Vinci, its style suggests the date when he would not have yet looked so old. Some in the art world believe the portrait was actually drawn by a clever forger. Well, I found something really interesting here. Look. Lillian set out to prove her theory. Eventually, she came across this study of an Italian duchess named Isabella that many believe was a preliminary sketch of the Mona Lisa. When Lillian compared the drawing of Isabella to an X-ray of the painting, she found that it matched an undersketch that people always assumed was the Mona Lisa. For her, it was a crucial detail. I'm convinced that Leonardo started with Isabella and then he used himself to complete this work of art. Changed much of what was the Duchess, incorporating his own uh, dimensions and forehead to create this fictionalized face. However, Professor Kathleen Brandt argues that Lillian's theory conflicts with da Vinci's own philosophy about art. Leonardo cautioned artists that every painter somehow paints himself. That is, that his own self-image is somehow inherent in his images of others. Leonardo says we have to try to counteract that. So therefore, it would be absolutely a contradiction if he would should willingly impose his image into that of a young woman. So, did Leonardo da Vinci serve as his own model for the world's most famous painting? For 500 years, the Mona Lisa has kept her secret. And maybe that's why she is still smiling.